First, Maureen, why is it important to know the history of women reporting war? Well, first of all, when we think about war, we think about war generally as the ultimate male experience. But what we really need to think about is war as the ultimate human experience, or perhaps the ultimate uh, experience that is inhumane. So it's very important to have women uh, covering war too and bringing in uh, a human dimension that so often has been lost in uh, male reporting. Do you think that women report war stories different than men? Do you think women get a different kind of access than male reporters? It depends on when in my career you'd ask me that question. Um, you would get different answers. I think in the beginning and the early stages of my career when there were few of us, the answer is yes. I think that women um, in, in my early career did report the wars differently. Um, and somewhere in the middle of my career, all of a sudden, there were, you know, 50-50. We were, uh, editors were understanding that women should come, and male reporters were understanding that we were doing something that they could do too if they only looked. And I think today I would say that the differences in, in genders and how wars are reported is not that different, certainly not on the NPR staff. Um, I find that my male colleagues are doing the same kind of, of looking, um, civilian reporting, uh, as, as women correspondents do. Um, at the same time, war reporting in itself has changed. War reporting now for everybody is so much more about civilians. In fact, in, in a lot of wars, civilians are the target. The point is to make refugees. So the story has shifted as well. So it's a very elastic answer um, because war has changed and reporters have changed. I wonder if you could speak a bit about the whole question of credentialing, which is when I was uh, covering wars for a very short period of time, only four years, but I never was credentialed once, ever. Um, I was, it was a choice on my part. I never wanted to have to answer to anyone. I got in trouble sometimes because of that because you know, we were out there without a credential. But I really felt it was important um, to be as freelance as I possibly could and to just kind of be um, out there without the safety net but with, with nobody telling me what I could and couldn't do. Um, I think that that was a time period, 1988 to 92, when that could happen. And I think as soon as the Gulf War, the first Gulf War uh, occurred, you couldn't cover that war without credentials. So um, I think that things have changed. And again, Deborah can speak a lot more clearly to the modern day version of that. Yeah, th there's no gender differences now in credentialing at all. Um, but you're right, 19, uh, uh, in, in the first Gulf War, it's not that you couldn't cover the war without credentials, you couldn't cover the war without the military uh, because you couldn't get there. There was no way to be a unilateral. The recent events in Egypt and Tunisia and what's going on in North Africa have seemed to me have changed the war story enormously. And I wonder if you could address that. I think traditional media actually did their job better than I've ever seen. Um, and you saw all the outlets doing a, a, a good job. In the same way, social media was a force uh, in this story uh, that I also have Or a trigger. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, what I always say is technology doesn't cause revolutions, people do. Um, it's just that they have this particular tool. Um, but I saw the kind of reporting on Twitter um, that I would attribute to uh, you know, mainstream media, people who uh, spent all day writing tweets um, uh, as, as full-fledged reporters, and, and that was new to me. How long has it been since you started this, since you got the very first idea for this documentary? It seems like it was a million years ago. It was actually in 1988 when I read a book about women war correspondents and read um, each chapter was devoted to a woman war correspondent, and it was the Dickie Chappelle story in particular that uh, just captivated me. And I couldn't believe that uh, somebody had lived this life and that I had never heard of her. And then I started asking people, had they ever heard of her? And uh, nobody had. And so this became sort of a burning passion uh, in my life to uh, sort of resurrect the story of these women. 
How, as a reporter or as a photographer, do you get the public back involved to care about what's going on in either Afghanistan or Iraq? Because it just seems that the American public is just not as involved in it as we've seen in some previous wars. Because we have an all-volunteer army, I'm afraid that many Americans just sort of close their eyes to uh, what the uh, uh, military may be doing. I'm not sure if it's if, if we have the power to make the American public pay attention uh, to to war. Uh, you know, there there is something now I think fundamentally wrong with the structure of how our media works. Um, and I can tell you that during the most recent events, um, Al Jazeera had a huge spike uh, in Americans who found them on the web, because there's no way that you can see them here except for three obscure cable companies in the United States, because they were covering the Middle East, and, and Americans were hungry for that kind of visual news, and there was no other place to find it. Uh, the American networks were late, uh, behind, uh, ill-informed, because they were out of practice. Given what happened to Laura Logan in Egypt, do you think uh, it, it is going to be more difficult for women to be sent into war zones? No. Uh, no. I, I think that she was very brave in uh, bringing to light something that we all uh, darkly know happens. Um, you know, we saw each other earlier saying that somebody called me for an interview and I said, oh, it's so rare that this happens, completely forgetting that it happened to me. I just so put it out of my mind because I was embarrassed and ashamed of the same kind of incident where somebody grabbed my behind and I swung out of the microphone and ended up you know, getting stoned and having five stitches in the back of my head and I completely buried it and said, oh, this doesn't Oh yeah, it does. What Laura did is just bring it to the public. Um, yeah, it happens. Um, but it also happens that in war zones, uh, women get shot at and so do men. There are plenty of places where it doesn't matter. I wrote about, in Shutterbake, I wrote about um, an octogenarian rabbi during the Intifada who I had an appointment to meet in my hotel room who sexually assaulted me and I ended up um, pushing I tried to push him down the stairs, and um, bystanders intervened. And you know, I wrote about the story because it just seemed so outrageous. And listen, I have a 15-year-old boy and a 14-year-old girl. I worry more about the 14-year-old girl out in the world than I worry about more about the boy. But I'm, am I not going to let her walk on the streets by herself? No. Women, in every walk of life, in every domain, we have a, a greater risk of rape. What happened to me after I published the book, though, was that a lot of critics took umbrage with that and said that I was asking for it. So in the same way when you were asked to talk when Lara Logan was attacked, I was called a couple times. And I just, or, you know, I'll talk about it in this public forum because we're all here together, but I won't go on TV. I won't do any, I won't talk about this in a public forum because um, to be told that I was asking for it really destructive in a way that I can't possibly even express here. For a friend of mine who studied the response on both sides of it, that's been kind of 50-50 for some public has said, well, she shouldn't have been there, that kind of thing. So I don't think that the issues here in your film uh, by any means are uh, issues of ancient history.